Good. All right. Everybody ready? We're talking about teeth. Okay. As in topicality? Topicality, yes. Cool. As in topicality. All right. So the way I like to think about topicality is like uh, disad, but better. Because I like, I don't know, I like topicality arguments. So I'm going to learn about it that way. So it'll be much more, much easier to understand and extend. So the first part is you got to debate it like a disad. You've got to understand what the parts of a disad are. And then each of those matches up with a different part of T violation. So can you tell me what their four parts of the disad are? Okay. Yes, link internal internal link impact and uniqueness. Uh, I'm going to put those in different orders. Uniqueness, link, internal link and impact. Right? So you know what the four parts, may only know three, four parts of a T violation are. Yeah. Um, your inter violation. Mm -hmm. Um why you should vote on it? Yeah. Standards. Standards. All right. Yeah, those are all four of them. I'm talking about those. They each match up with part of a T violation. All of those four match up with part of the disset. Uniqueness. That's your interpretation. We'll talk about it a little bit. Link, the violation. Internal link are standards. And the impact is always fairness or education. The impact to most every theory argument, I think, is either fairness or education. How that Argue how the affirmative makes debate unfair, or how the affirmative makes debate uneducational. All of the things, all of the standards that you talk about, will culminate in one of those two impacts. Oh. Right? Mm -hmm. Just to get this right, you said uniqueness was interpretation, link is the violation, internal link is the standards, and then the impact is fairness. And fairness and education, yes. And we'll talk, we'll go more in depth on each of those a little bit. But how do you debate this as a block? All right, what's the first thing you do when you're extending a dis -add? No. Or well, the first you want. Overview. All right. In the block, you do the same sort of overview. The sentence that you should start with, that every T over you should start with in 2 and C is, or the 1 and R, is a topical affirmative must, then whatever your interpretation is, what a topical affirmative must do. Right? To clearly outline that this is our interpretation. The next thing that you do is impact calculus. Talk about why limits come first or why predictability comes first. And I'll talk about that in a little bit when I get to the standards part of this lecture. Right? But you do impact calculus. Then there's also line by line, right? You have to answer every argument and do comparisons the same way you would compare different arguments if you're extending a dis out. We're going to talk about each part more in depth. First is the interpretation. The example that I'll use is this, so the AF is limited to expanding economic ties. That's what is backed up by a definition of the phrase economic engagement, right? Your interpretation describes what the limits of the resolution are. So if you think about it in the way that I was taught it, as like a fence. If this is the resolution, your interpretation should describe everything that can fall inside the bounds of the resolution. Right? Anything outside is not topical. It's the same way that a uniqueness argument describes what is currently happening in the status quo. An interpretation describes what the resolution should or what it looks like, what the resolution looks like. Right? So then, how do we compare them? What sorts of things do you think make uniqueness arguments? How do you compare them? What makes a uniqueness argument better than another uniqueness argument? Credibility of authors. Qualifications, yes, right? Obviously, there are a lot of people qualified to talk about what the phrase economic engagement means, but there are also a lot of people who aren't qualified. I, having done not a lot of research, didn't study this at all in school, would not be someone who is very qualified to talk about what that phrase means. But someone who works for the government or does deals with trade negotiations with other countries, would probably know about this, right? What's another one? Date. Date, recency. Now, this was less important than uniqueness debates, but still very important. Because definitions do change, right? The government changes its definitions of things all the time. So if there's a drastic change or a change in how some word was defined, and their evidence is older than that, that's something that you can talk about. What's another one? 
All right, context, right? If your uniqueness argument is talking about the status quo, how the economy is doing in Russia, for instance, that's not as applicable if the affirmative demand is about the US economy, right? Similarly, if the interpretation evidence is talking about economic engagement as defined by another country, or if it was another word, if they were talking about the word substantially as defined in the context of subsidies for energy production or something, <laughs> right? The, that thing, that, that definition of the term substantially would not probably relate to economic engagement at all, right? So that's something you think about is context. There's one last one, not as, re not as relevant to uniqueness arguments, but it's about the intent to define, right? A lot of people, when writing about the phrase economic engagement, will list a bunch of things that they think it might include, but they don't mean to define it. They're just listing it in the context of that article. They're talking about something, right? There's other people who write, go out and seek to define the term economic engagement. Now, which one of those do you think would be better suited for an interpretation? The second one, right? Because that person is actually trying to define what that phrase is. All right, <clears throat> all of these things are used in comparing interpretations when you're doing line by line debate. If you want to say our interpretation is better than theirs, these are things you can use to, do, to compare the cards. The same way you would do that in line by line and the dis when we're talking about uniqueness of this. All right. Does anyone have any questions about interpretation? Cool. Violation, the second part. The violation describes what the AF does that is wrong. Right? The same way that a link on a disad describes what the app does that screws up the status quo. For instance, if you think about this, the topic fence, what else is in the topic? The violation is you saying that the app falls here, that is not inside the topic. The example here is that the app is commercial engagement and not economic engagement. Something like border cooperation might be commercial engagement and not economic engagement. That's the debate we have. But, do you need evidence for a violation? Maybe. Maybe. Right? You may need a card to prove the distinction between these, two, between these two things. What commercial engagement is versus what economic engagement is. That's not something that everyone just knows. Right? But if it's something that is very obvious, like the AF increases economic engagement with Brazil, which isn't in the topic, you obviously don't need a card to say the AF plan deals with Brazil in their plan text and everyone knows that, right? <laughs> so you might not need a card to talk about that. Totally dependent on what you're trying to prove. All right. Oh, can you go back? Here, here. Uh, why don't you read this? I'm going to take it through the paragraph. Read it out loud. Most of this book, including the first seven chapters, is written by Nicholas Bain and Stephen Wolcock of the LSC. But economic diplomacy is not just a subject for academic study. It is an activity pursued by state and non-state actors in the real world of today. In some respects, economic diplomacy is like sex. Easier to describe if you've practiced it yourself. So an integral part of this book provides a series of chapters, starting in chapter 8, written by experienced practitioners of economic diplomacy. I right? think it's a good, like, context, contextual evidence is better. Yeah, it is a good proof of why contextual evidence is better, right? <laughs> Something that you need to engage in to describe. All right, you done, right? you done writing this down? Yeah, I'm done. Cool. So, the link versus the link turn. How do we compare link arguments? In this end of it, how would you go about comparing link arguments? Why would you say one is better than the other? Recency? Recency? Kind of, I mean, matters less for, for that, but um, the same arguments are true for the interpretation that are for violation evidence. If your evidence is much more recent, takes into account recent developments, that might be better. The two big ones that I think apply to the violation and to the link arguments on topicality are context and qualifications. If they read a piece of evidence about what your AF does, or they claim it's about what your AF does, that actually isn't about the thing your AF does. For instance, if their evidence is about commercial engagement versus economic engagement, but doesn't mention border cooperation, probably not the greatest card ever, right? Because it's not in the same context. That's another thing. Qualifications. I talked about the interpretation. But 
The Interpretation and the Violation Act will work together. Some interpretation arguments go to prove violation arguments. For instance, if the violation is carded, but your interpretation is carded, and that proves that they are outside of the resolution, for the Brazil example, they kind of work hand in hand. Yes, Anderson. Wait, so qualifications as in like their author, yeah. so if they got any evidence from the onion.com, that means that the qualifications. They're not qualified. Okay. Not cool. qualified. Versus like a piece of evidence from someone who works in the government and does trade negotiations with Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, there's obviously debates to be had about whether just dictionary definitions versus definitions that are written by the government are better or not, right? Or legal definitions versus like just regular dictionaries, right? There's a debate to be had about which one is more qualified, but they're both fine. All right. The meat of the tea debating. Reasons to vote negative. All right? You have to prove that your interpretation is the best. Usually this is called standards, but in the 1MC, I like to call it reasons to vote negative because it tells the judge that these are the reasons why your interpretation is better, and you don't have to add on that last sentence that everyone likes to say, this is a voter for fairness and education, which is a claim without a warrant. All right? So what are some of the standards, T standards? Yeah. Fairness and education. No, those are impacts. Oh. Oh. Hey, ground. Ground. Predictable limits. Predictable limits. Right, limits right here. Predictability. Someone else? Any more? Makes us quit debate. Impact argument. Any more? All right. Um, how about this? Anyone heard this send it to you before? Bright line. Okay, we'll talk about it. All right, what about, this is a good one that people use in high school, like grammar. I think these are, these are fair. I think limits and ground are the big two. The ones you want to focus on when you're negative. All right, limits. What does this mean? What does is, what is the limit standard say? Yeah. Like the app should have limits on what they can read, that's why, because then it's unfair to the right. Yeah, there should be limits on what the affirmative reads. There should be this fence on what describes the resolution. Otherwise, it makes it really difficult to be neg if the app can choose anything they want. If there's no limit. There's no way the neg can do all that research, right? If the app could be whatever it wants, be real, the negative would have a really tough time researching all of that to win debates. All right? Ground. The, the, the topic is neg ground, so it's what the neg can research. That's what does it mean in the context of a T violation? Oh, You're okay. saying our interpretation provides is better because we have this neg ground standard. What does that mean? I've heard it before, but I don't know how to put it in the words. Maybe it means that, like, you know, when you said that you were drawing your fence and how much the neg can do, but if your fence keeps. Oh, well, this no. fence is about the ask. Oh, wait. Whoops. <laughs> All right, right? Um. All right, cool. So, you got it? Right, yeah. The arguments that the neg can run, is it like the number of arguments? Yeah, the neg ground is like the arguments the neg can run. In this context, it means that. The affirmative is chosen in an app that's outside of this. Now, when the next doing research before the season, right, they've probably come up with this definition of the topic, and they've said, we need good core negative ground that links to all of this, right? But if something falls out here, it might not link to that, right? If all of your disads deal with economic engagement, but the app can just get up and say, well, we're commercial engagement, not economic engagement, so we don't link to your engage any of your economic engagement DAs. Makes it really unfair for the neg. It also makes it very difficult to learn anything if you can't actually engage in a debate that has clash. Because any dissed you read, the neg the AF can say, well, that's not us. We're not economic engagement. We're a different type of engagement. Alright? These are the big two. It's most of what we want to fo what you want to focus on, so they make the most sense. Now, Ortaz, you said predictable limits, which is good. A lot of people just have predictability standards, like 
the F's not predictable. Do you think that means anything? No, because an F can be not predictable, but it's still topical. Right? You could just have not thought of it. Right? But predictability can work to enhance these two arguments. For instance, if you call it, if it's a predictable ground argument, then you would say that all of the core negative ground inside here is predictable. Any other ground that you give us out here is not predictable. Because it's not part of the resolution. There's no way we could have predicted it. In here, we could have predicted something and could have cut a chord to said that answered it. Out here, we couldn't have. Same with predictable limits. Because a limiting resolution might not always be a good idea if, for instance, your box was just this. That's super limiting. But maybe not predictable because you've arbitrarily cut off all of this, right? So if you looked at the resolution, this would be topical, this would probably be topical, this would probably be topical. But if your interpretation was just this, it's not very predictable because you could pick any square inside there, right? So predictability works. Predictability works to enhance those other two. Bright line is another standard that people often use. <coughs> that it's pretty straightforward, means exactly what it sounds like. That there's a very clear and concise delineation of what is topical and what isn't topical, right? Our interpretation evidence provides a list of a bunch of things that are economic engagement and examples of what isn't economic engagement, right? That's a very clear, bright line. Some interpretations do not provide that sort of clear, bright line, are very murky about what they mean. Now, why do you think Having a clear bright line would be good. Right? It makes it a whole lot easier to be negative because you know exactly which parts, what parts of the topic they have can be, what areas they can research, things like that. If it's, there's no clear bright line, it's much more difficult because you have to do some digging. There might be stuff that you don't predict and stuff like that, right? Grammar, there's other ones other standards that people, people will say that inevitably just fall back into one of these four. Grammar is another one that I never understood as a, T inter a, a standard for topicality because it just, I don't know. Grammar, yes, your interpretation may be more grammatical. Does that make it more limiting? Does that make it better for ground? It may, grammar can be used as a way to compare interpretation evidence. Interpretation comparison can be used, can, grammar can be used effectively there. If someone has defined uh, the word out of context or the word substantial instead of substantially or something like that, right? This is not grammatically in context, which may bring up other results, which may mean their definition is worse. But I don't think that having an ungrammatical definition necessarily makes that definition worse for debate which is why I don't really think is a great standard and why you should stick to the ground on this. All right, how do you impact this part of the debate? We talked about it earlier. Fairness and education are the two impacts. When we're explaining these limits, if the limit is way too broad, it's not fair to the negative, right? So just warrant that out. So it's way too broad. The negative can't do any research very easily because there's so much the F could say, which makes it unfair. The reason debate being unfair is bad, people will quit, it's very difficult to be negative, which makes activity not fun anymore. It's a game that has rules, right? If the, if the game's not fair, why are we even playing? Education is another one. Ground, right? If the negative doesn't have any ground to have in the debate, if they can't have a debate that clashes, the debate isn't very educational, is it? If, if you can't respond to them with saying anything that you have, then based on educational, right? All of your standards should get to fairness or ground. Those are the, those are the impacts you want to get to in a debate. Questions? Standards? All right. Topicality. Is it a voter? Heard like everything under the sun. People saying that after they read their standards, they'll say, Topicality is a voter for fairness and education. I'm a college voter for jurisdiction because my mom said it was. You will actually said that. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> um, all of these are dumb, dumb phrases. Talk about your vocabulary when you're 18. You should warrant 
why you should impact these arguments and not say, not make any of these assertions. I'm going to move away from random assertions and start explaining the impacts of these arguments. So that you can say, A, interpretation, here's our interpretation. B, violation, here's our violation. C, reasons to vote negative. And then make those arguments. And then you can cut out that last thing that everyone says. D, top Catholics and voter for fairness education. Because you've already said that the reasons to vote negative and you've already impacted those out. Right? It's a better way to frame the topicality debate rather than just asserting that it's a voter. And then everyone, the other people saying, like, they didn't extend their voter, so you can't vote on T, right? But they extended standards, which are reasons to vote negative. All right. Now, when a judge is evaluating debates, T debates especially, they need to have a frame for how to view the debate. On the negative, you want that frame to be competing interpretations, which is the idea that the judge should pick from two interpretations and pick the interpretation which is best for the topic. All right? So how does the judge do this? How do you think? You tell them. You tell them. Standards. You tell them our interpretation is better and answer their standards and do impact comparison, just like you would on a disad, and say, look, our interpretation is better, so you should pick that. Why do you think this is the best way to evaluate T debates? Some reasons. Anyone? As opposed to reasonability, which we'll talk about in a second. You probably already heard of. Why grounded minutes is the best way? No, why competing interpretations is the best frame for viewing topicality debates. Oh, because it's F versus negative. It's just, it's kind of cut and cold. If you win one, you win it. Instead of like, hey, we've got 60 different definitions against your one, the judge can choose any one of ours. Well, yeah, two, the judge doesn't really need to pick from two. The F could make more than one. Why do you think that the judge should default to picking the best interpretation? Because that's what defines right. the violation. I'll rephrase it a little bit. That is just the most logical way to evaluate a debate, right? If the judge is for, if the judge can vote for an interpretation that might not be as good, why would they do that, right? The same thing, the, the for the same reasons that Sarah talked about logical decision making when we talked about international fiat and fifty state fiat. Why would you ever want to teach a decision making model? where the judge said, well, the app's interpretation wasn't that good. The next was better, but I'm still going to vote app, right? That doesn't make any sense. Some other reasons that it's good, right? It's the only not arbitrary way to do this, right? Can you tell me what that means? I don't mean it is. Yeah, right? It's not arbitrary. The judge can look at their flow and say, the AF won this, the NEG won this, I think the NEG's interpretation is better, so I'm going to vote NEG. That happens because of the debating that the debaters do. Do anything else where the judge can just pick an interpretation becomes much more arbitrary and not defined by what the debaters do. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Cool, let's talk about T, answering T now. Answering T still fits the analogy of answering, you debate like you're answering a dissad. So if someone says, like, they, like the summary of a dissad is the negating up and saying, you've done something bad, what is the first response you want to make? It's not a dissad. No, we haven't. We haven't done something bad. So the first thing you say is a we meet. Just like a no-link argument, you're saying, yes, we are economic engagement. We fit in the definition that you've provided. We have not done something bad. Do you need evidence for this? The same way you need evidence for a violation debate, you may need to read evidence if it exists, and you definitely need to explain something that isn't common knowledge. If it's not common knowledge, read evidence about it. If it is, you don't have to read evidence about it, right? You want to make a me we meet. And you can make more than one if you want to, if you have different ways to phrase this. The second argument that the action make is a counterinterpretation. Very similar to a non-unique argument, you challenge the next view of what the topic should be about. You say, actually, this is the resolution, not that. All right? We have a different interpretation of the resolution. 
very similar to that, should be backed up by the definition, by a definition of the word that they have defined. All right? All of the comparison stuff that we talked about for violations, interpretations apply when you're on the app comparing them as well. Yes? So, say they say you're not topical based on economic engagement. Can you say you're topical based on like, the word in the resolution, or do you have to say it? Um, well, all right. So, let's say they get up and say, you're not economic engagement. And you get up and define the word Cuba and say, we are, we do engagement with Cuba. Why would that matter if you're not economic engagement? It would, right? You certainly need to answer, the, you re, need to redefine the word that they have defined. Because even if you meet every other part of the topic, if you don't meet the word Cuba, or you don't meet the word economic engagement, then you're going to lose. Right? All right, the next part, people call it counter standards, I guess. I like to just say, prefer our interpretation. So after you read your interpretation, you say, prefer our interpretation and you provide offensive reasons for why your interpretation is good for debate. Can you even think of any AF standards? There's AF standards for topicality. Ground? Yes, ground. This time you're going to be talking about AF ground, right? Because you're arguing the topic should be a little less limited, a little bit broader, right? AF ground is one of them. Another one? Yeah, if your definition is more limiting or provides better night ground, you can certainly say those things. There's another big one that the app needs to focus on. It's a topic education argument. There's two things that you need to win when you're affirmative debating a T violation. The first is that your app is good to talk about. It's educational. It should be included in the topic. And second is that it's hard to be F. Those are the two things you need to win when you're winning a T debate when you're F. F, the topic education argument, provides the first one. You want to say that the education that your interpretation allows is the best education that you could have on this topic. That their interpretation of economic engagement limits out things like foreign investment and discussions of exports and imports and stuff like that, all of which are core things that we should learn about. And if you can't win that, it's very difficult to win a debate. The second one is an AF ground standard. And you have to win that it is difficult to be AF. It's very difficult. That the boundaries they've set up don't provide that many AFs, that there's like three of them. And that it's very difficult to win if you only have three AFs. So that you should have, you, you need, so then you, that implies that you need boundaries that are a little bigger, that allow for more creativity when you're AF, right? So that it's easier to be F. Because it is it is pretty difficult to be F, right? There's a bunch of different stuff, a bunch of different stuff that negatives can do. T violations are really short, and they can limit it down to whatever they want. So um, predictability also goes with those two. Obviously, F creativity is good to an extent. If it's not predictable, it's probably not good. So you want to phrase them in terms of the creativity that we create is predictable within the resolution, and so is the education. The education that we think is good to talk about that they limit out is predictable based on what the resolution says. This part of the debate, where you say prefer our interpretations, the next thing that you should do is answer the neg standards. So if they say you explode limits, that you make the topic unlimited, you should say no, we actually do have a limit on the topic. It might not be as big as yours, or it might not be as small as yours. But it is still a good limit, right? It's not that bad, like impact defense. If they say that you destroyed night ground, you should list out a bunch of arguments that they still get. You still get your oil dissat. You still get your politics dissat. All the core negative ground that you think is core negative ground, you should answer and say, no, your standards are wrong. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? So like, you know those apps that kind of like have in their inherency like, oh yeah, funding is there, non-union so it's just more funding is increased. So could you make like, you're not giving like, we don't get any ground, you're like, you're not giving us any dissatisfaction on anything? Well, that's more of an inherency argument, right? If there's funding there, but they just increase it, I they need to have a reason why that funding that's there now is insufficient, which would be their inherency argument. 
And if they don't, if they just think that more money, if their argument is just more money would be good, but it's okay right now with that amount of money, then you would need to make an inherency argument that says, look, their AF isn't inherent. It's already being done. They just do it more, right? And yes, it's very difficult to win any disad if the app's already happening. But that can be a very short argument you make on case. You don't really need to define any words in the resolution to prove that they aren't inherent. All right. Lastly, framing on the app. Another thing that everyone says, lit checks abuse, clash checks abuse, you know, aliens check abuse, they'll, they'll prevent us from being abusive, they'll help us out, right? Um, nobody cares, nobody cares. Yeah, there's literature on everything, there is. There's the, everyone writes about everything. That doesn't mean that it is predictable by any means, right? You could clash with anything too. Like just because you saw that this team posted their app on the case list, and it's way out here, it's not topical, but you are actually good at debate, so you decided we should still have a case neck to that, right? It doesn't mean that because you have clash, that doesn't mean that they're topical by any means, all right? Framing on the app should be done by reasonability. And the shortest definition of reasonability I can give you is that if the app doesn't make it impossible to debate, they shouldn't lose the debate, all right? So, Wait, then, wouldn't the app just win every time then? Hmm? Wouldn't the app just win every time if they said that? Well, why? Because you're debating topicality and it's not impossible to debate that, so wouldn't they win? What do you mean it's not impossible? Like you said, if it doesn't make it impossible to debate. If you're debating the topicality, that means it's not impossible to debate. So It is, if, if the only thing you can say to the app is topicality, it is impossible, right? you have nothing else to say, yeah? Couldn't he still like attack their evidence? Just like get up in the 1NC and say this card is bad because of this and this card is bad because of this? What's your offensive argument? And you just take out their whole lap. Well that just means that you're doing something to make it like that. That debate wouldn't be How fun. easy do you think the 2AR would be if you can get up and say look they've only said that our cards are bad if there is even a 1% chance that we do something good, you should vote F, right? The negative has to win 100% that the F doesn't solve. And really, all you're doing then is trying to win 100% that the F doesn't do anything with just analytic arguments about how bad their cards are. Which, I mean, the F's had a long time to do research. Some of their cards might be bad. I guarantee you all of the cards will not be bad. Not be bad enough where you can get up and just to destroy the case with just analytic arguments, right? You need offense. Offense wins debates. And if you can't predict what offense to read, it's really difficult to debate, right? Now, I don't think that you'll ever win that debate is impossible because the app does something, but if you win that it's really hard, like really, really hard to debate. We didn't have any generics. We had some case defense and a politics disad, but that's about it, right? Then you can probably win TV. That's, that's what I mean by impossible, right? So the negative gets up and says, well, that's arbitrary, right? What do you think the what do you think is the answer to that? Okay. Can you explain what arbitrary means? Arbitrary is just like kind of not grounded in anything meaningless. It's just like, the app, if, it, arbitrary would be like, if there's a resolution, and the resolution is about economic engagement, and all of this probably could be economic engagement, but the app says, you know it was a much better topic? Um, the space topic that we debated a couple years ago. We should do that, right? Not really, not really based in any resolution or anything. It's just like, well, we think it's better, so let's do it, right? That's kind of arbitrary. Reasonability, I would say, is arbitrary. Yeah? You would say that the app interpretation is better? Yeah, right. You're not saying, well, that's in a competing interpretation state. You're saying your interpretation is better. But also, it's not really arbitrary to say that our interpretation is good enough. We have an interpretation. It would be arbitrary just to say, like, our app's cool, vote for it. That's arbitrary. If you have a resolution, a, 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 an interpretation, based in the resolution, that's not as arbitrary, all right? 
Secondly, this is the one area where I think the idea of debating this like this at deviates when you're at. Can the F win a debate on like link turns or impact turns on T like they do on a disad? No, right? If you straight impact turn a disad, the neg has to go for it. But if you just got up and proved your interpretation is way better than theirs, want a bunch of offense on T, the negative can just get up and say, all right, cool, you're topical, right? They don't have to do anything. It's what we call a no risk argument. Because they can read T. But there's no way reading T causes them to lose the debate. This is the way that reading just a throwaway disad could if it's impact turned, right? So why should the AF be held to the standard of proving that their interpretation is just vastly superior than the NEGS if the NEG is just allowed to not go for it any time? Yeah? Because if they don't, then they, uh, the NEG can just hammer them on it, then they'll lose. Or they'll probably lose it. And then also because... Not if they win this argument. Oh, okay. Well, if they... Because of conditionality? No. So, I mean, if you think that it's related, you can explain it. Yeah, um, well, I'll just think. I don't get it. Yeah? Wait. So the app can't win if they uh, don't go for the T? If the neg doesn't go for T, the app can't win on T. But when the neg doesn't go for it, they don't have to say they're kicking the T, right? Nope. They don't. If they say they kick the teeth, then can the app run combo? No. Yeah. Topicality isn't a, an advocacy that you're running conditionally. It's just a procedural argument where you said, uh, look, there's rules and you violated one of them. And at any point in the debate, they can get up and just not go for it. And that's them implicitly saying, like, I guess you didn't violate the rules, whatever. Well, I saw, like, around, the judge said they didn't like time wasters. All right. Uh, All right, these are remember, possibly okay, the... What happened in the debate when um, Ajit tried to go for, for that argument? The, in the 2 and on yesterday? What did I do? You are like, no. <laughs> I interrupted him, told him to stop. This is possibly the dumbest argument in debate. Is that, oh, T is a time skew, and you just read it, so we had to answer it. And then you were never going to go for it. So you should lose because you read T. Right? It doesn't make any sense. For one, how do you know? How do you know? We really wanted to go for T, but your answers were really good. Right? Well, like, specifically in the round I saw, they kicked it in the 2NC. The first thing they said, no, I don't know. Well, here's the thing. That's the argument that they'll make. The AF will say, well, you just read T because you wanted us to spend time on it, which is really why the negative reads everything to get the AF to answer it. But um, they say, you just write T because you wanted us to spend time on it, waste that time, so we couldn't answer anything else, right? But it's really difficult to know what the negative was thinking when they're at T. That might not have been the case. Um, secondly, why might it be bad if the negative could lose T to base like that? Because then as soon as they read a tropical app, then the neg loses, like, then they the time as long as it's tropical. Yeah, but what, what might that, what, what happens because of that? If the negative keeps losing on T because they read T, what, what would the negative start not doing? Negatives would start reading less T, so apps would start getting more and more on top of it. Right? If the app can just get up and say, like, reading topicality is really abusive to us because we have to spend time answering it, and, it, and I don't know, that's bad, um, negatives would stop reading T. They would just start doing other stuff because they can do. There's a lot of stuff that negative can do, even if you're not topical, really. Consult counterplans, counterplans that do all of the AF, a bunch of critiques that probably still link to the AF. The negative can do a bunch of other stuff, but that means that the AF can just become less and less topical and less and less topical because they know that if the neg reads T, you can just say, "Well, they should lose because it's a time skew. It's T. It's time skew, right? You should lose, right?" Time skew. So is it that that, the, that judge's paradigm was like, I don't like time, time was Yeah, I mean, some judges are not going to, oh boy. Yay, sorry. Uh, the shirts are for you guys, and the timers are for them. Oh, wow. Nice. We don't get a timer?
question really of what it means to waste time. Is it wasting time to read topicality? No, not if you have a coherent topicality argument that's like, here's what we think it is, here's why we think the app violates it, and here's why our interpretation is better. That's a coherent argument that the app should answer, and if they don't answer it, they should lose. Not a time scheme. But, I mean like, he might, I don't know why you would ever vote against someone for reading a dumb T violation. I, like, if you got up and read like three T violations that were all extraordinarily dumb, the AF probably met all of them just to get the AF to spend time on it. I might like give you less speaker points, but I certainly would never say like you should lose the debate because of that. Since we're in this subject, like, should we follow a judge's paradigms if it's something like they don't like counterclaims? Yes. Yes. But that's wholly, that's different from T. Yeah. I think most judges like T. They just don't like it when you waste time by reading dumb arguments, which is generally a good rule. Don't read dumb arguments. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, if you could just read topicality like that, like say it was a time waster, couldn't you technically say that to anything like DAs too, like you just read that anywhere else you're going to go for it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's why time skews is cheater. Yeah. What about when, like, there's no conditionality argument going on in the debate, but the judge himself said that you, the neg can't drop anything? Like, he said that uh, in his paradigm, that the neg can't drop anything. I mean, there's a lot of judges that have different paradigms for how they debate, or how they judge debates. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Their paradigm is the neg can't kick anything. Then maybe you don't want to do that. Someone who's, like, probably a bit older, um, doesn't keep up with like competitive debate that often. Something you might want to listen to, all right? Um, but I feel like most judges, and I haven't seen a judge yet that has said, I will not evaluate T or topicality arguments. It is one of the stock issues that you have to be topical, all right? Um, but yeah, the last thing is, is about reasonability. Your argument is essentially saying that since the AF has to prove that they are topical, but can never win any offense to stick the negative with that argument, the AF should not be burdened with proving that they have the best interpretation. They should just be burdened with proving that their interpretation makes debate educational or good. Like you have an okay educational, your, your interpretation limits the topic, all right, and it's not too small, but you know it's not super big, and it's educational, and that's good to debate. Right? That's how the AF wants to frame the debate. Anything else about the NEG wants to frame the debate? The competing interpretation how the NEG wants to frame the debate. Questions? Comments? Concerns? Complaints? Yeah. Just to like make sure, when you run a T, you just, all you do is like say why they're not helpful and read a definition. You should start with an interpretation. The way the one and C should look is, in fact, I'll just pull this up to have it done ready. All right, the one and C should start. Interpretation. Economic engagement is limited to expanding economic ties. Selic in 11, right? It's backed up by a definition. And then you say two, violation. Economic and commercial engagement are different. The plan is commercial. All right? Read card, because that is something that not many people would know the distinction between. Certainly before this reading, before reading this card, I would not have been able to tell you the difference between those two things. Three, reasons to vote negative. A, limits. So you have explained the limits argument and impacted it as a reason to vote. Same thing with ground. That is a top Cali violation I want to see. Shouldn't take that, shouldn't take that long. You efficiently explain what the topic should be about, that they aren't about that, and that that is a reason to vote negative. All right? <coughs> Similarly, the 2AC starts with a we meet argument that I should have titled we meet, but this kind of quickly. 
First argument that border infrastructure improvements are economic engagement and they should be considered alongside trade aid and development policies, right? So we meet argument that we are actually economic engagement. The second argument is a counter interpretation that economic engagement includes promoting crop includes promoting cross border exchanges. Do you have a list or no? Go talk to Grant. He's in 216. Right? Includes promoting cross border exchanges. Now, this piece of evidence defines what economic engagement is. It's about as much increasing cross border investment and engagement as about changes in gross or net exports or impacts. A bunch of things that are umbrellas that describe what economic engagement is. And then you say three reasons to prefer. I have picked two of them AF creativity. Limiting the F to expanding economic ties cause, to cause some action to occur, which is what their evidence says, right? Means that exports, investment, and trade are all not topical, which makes being F impossible because, you know, there's a lot of different, I mean, like, there's some, some T debate is hyperbole, like, use the word impossible a lot. You never really mean impossible, you mean, like, really, really hard. Because there's all of those things, exports, investment, trade, all of those things are good things to learn about and it prevents the F from being creative and writing new arguments. Makes a fairness argument. Then topic education. Exports and investment are key areas to learn about on a topic of about economic engagement. Their interpretation makes debate stale and educationless, right? Because there's a bunch of things that the F has outlined that are core parts of what we should learn about on a topic about economic engagement. And they say that the, that the negatives interpretation means we'll never learn about those. We never have debates. Four, no impact argument. There's still only three countries, so core disadds to engagement with any of them uh, mean the negative always has something to say, right? Because it's not like the F is, it's not like the F can just do whatever they want. You can still get disadds to doing stuff with Venezuela, Cuba, or Mexico even if you haven't predicted the one small mechanism that we use. Five, evaluate the debate through the lens of reasonability. T is a no-risk argument for the neg, so we only need to prove we don't make debate impossible to win the round. All right? You may need a longer T block with more cards in it if your F is less topical, but this F is pretty topical, so the T violation, is just the, the answers are less because we defend it with just those two cards. All right? Does that make sense to anybody? Does that answer your question? Cool. Ask us questions so we can get timers. Um, you're going to do T speeches, so those are good. You can get timers. Yeah, Anderson? Yeah, go ahead.